It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 260 at block height 674,635, Sunday, March 14th. And uh, a wild Janine appears. Yes, I'm here. Grab your Pokeballs. <laughs> Glad to have We better you capture her so she doesn't run away. Well, should we go with the Ultra Ball or. I do have that Master Ball I've been saving. She is a high power Pokemon. That that is the most interesting way someone has ever described me. <laughs> it is true. What are what are my powers? She won't give them away to us, that's for sure. Psychic powers and high intelligence. Oh Jesus. <laughs> Alrighty though. Alrighty. So lots of fun things to talk about today. Lots of fun things. So yeah. Fun. There, there are a lot of good things this week. I, I guess we're going to start with the FUD. Uh, it was reported this week that uh, good old BlockFi was attacked. And uh, I love the characterization of this. Um, let's see. Let's, let's get this headline. It's great. Crypto rising star BlockFi combats vulgar and racist spam attack. So somebody doesn't like BlockFi anymore. Don't know who this is. But evidently, as reported, accounts were registered with over 1,000 emails, roughly half of which were identified as valid emails belonging to real users. The attacker put offensive terms in the fields for first and last names on the account registration page, flooding the system with hundreds of unfinished registrations. And it was implied that that got emails perhaps to go to those people um, using interesting first and last names for them. This coincides with somebody releasing a website called Ditch BlockFi, which had a very interesting section at the end, which sadly I didn't archive, but I did catch a screen grab of. Well, not, I archived locally. I didn't archive so I could share. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, that had a bunch of logos down at the bottom. And that was kind of fun because some of those logos belong to BlockFi competitors. Um, but of course it was an anonymous website, not attributed to anybody. And then I saw a write up on, on somebody's, uh, site that suggested this anonymous site brings up some very good points you should think about on BlockFi. Um, of course, by the time they had written about it, they took all the sponsor images. I mean, competitors logos off of, uh, the bottom of that page. So sounds like BlockFi got fudded pretty good this week. Uh, they temporarily turned off registrations when that happened, and I believe they're back on now. But great yeah. stuff. Definitely not a transparent attack on a rising star in the crypto space. That is a really interesting light to things for me because, you know, when they first announced that, you know, you, you and me have been talking the last couple of weeks about how that coincided with the GBTC premium going negative and wondering if, you know, the reason for that sign up freeze might be issues and being able to cover, you know, interest payments at current interest rates. But yeah, <laughs> if that's what was going on, then I, I still caution people against things like that. And to think rationally and not do things like throw your whole stack into a service like that. But yeah, that, that is a very interesting, different take than where my mind was at all week. <laughs> yeah. If you want to hear a little bit more about that particular topic, Castle Island uh, had Zach Prince on from BlockFi uh, to talk about it. 
this past week. I thought that was a really good episode. Um, there's been a bit of interesting data that's come out as uh, he's been on their show. And then Renee, I'm going to forget his last name, was on their show, their risk management guy. Um, lots of good stuff in there. I've got the image in front of me. And of course, these are the companies that are probably not associated with Dish BlockFi. Companies like blockchain.com, Amber, Coinflex, Celsius, Nexo, Anchorage was on there. I was kind of surprised to see them on something like this. Maker, Ave, Compound. Um, yeah. So, good stuff, guys. Keep up the FUD. Mad game. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just, it's really weird when things like this happen. Because, like, you, you know, I, I don't like services like that. Um I, I don't think that people should just be diving headfirst into that without actually understanding what they're doing. And I don't like the way that a lot of people in the space just funnel people towards that. But like, it's kind of interesting how quickly rational arguments against something just turn into pumping total FUD. And I mean, it's like the this entire week, I have been sitting here wondering if they might be having not so much solvency issues, but like issues in being able to cover interest payments they have to. And then it's like, well, that's interesting. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. Yeah, it doesn't smell like that to me. There were a lot of interesting numbers that got dropped on the Castle Island podcast. Like their average user has $50,000 in their account on that platform, which has got to make all these other platforms feel poor and threatened. Uh, personally, I would tell anybody who is brand new to go get a BlockFi account instead of Coinbase or Gemini. Um, you're going to earn interest there, and that's going to make you interested in it, and it's going to make you more Bitcoin. So, yeah, my guess is the other guys are feeling the pinch at this point. And I would say keep most of your coins in your own keys and don't play with more than little drops and things like that. Yeah, as soon as you've got plenty of coin, feel free to self-host that stuff. But if you're buying 20 bucks at a time, I don't know that that's necessarily good advice to take those out to UTXOs every time. But it all depends what you think the blockchain fee market is going to do in the future. I think what this means is we have to fight to the death. Nah, you guys will all figure it out eventually. <laughs> Alrighty, though. Um guess if there's nothing else on this um something else next that i thought would be related to this story but i guess is not so much yeah speaking of negative gbtc premiums uh I think the market has, in general, been a little shook up by this this week. Uh, part of this is two Canadian ETFs for Bitcoin have now dropped, and we still have exactly zero in the United States, though there are a whole bunch of applications open. I, I can't even tell you how many. It might be as many as 10 or more. Um, so basically, everybody wants to offer a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, so GBTC has traded at a negative premium, which has been exceptionally rare in its life cycle. Uh, it's been above negative 10% or lower than negative 10%. And it's been running on the order of maybe 4 to 5% a lot of the time this last week, which has left everybody scratching their chin. Um, there's a lot of different ways maybe to analyze this, but... Uh, I have to imagine the ETFs and or companies figuring out that they would like to physically custody Bitcoin are responsible for some of this. So to combat the uh, negative premium and perceived shortcomings of their products, Digital Currency Group, DCG, has announced that they will spend up to $250 million to buy shares in the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Uh, which I don't have a size of on hand. It's it's some number of billions of dollars. So they claim they're going to use cash on hand to potentially purchase these shares on the market, um, I assume, to try to shore up public confidence in this. Uh, they also posted on their website a whole plethora of job openings around fielding ETFs, which led to all sorts of speculation. But of course, the SEC is in charge of when we get a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, but if I was DCG, 
those job recs are about the best way I could pump uh, the price of that product without actually doing anything. Yeah. This, um, yeah, I mean, I can't really see any explanation for this other than people realize there are ways they can just have physical coins instead of a promise from GBTC. And like, <laughs> yeah, uh, the longer this keeps on like the more positive i am that's just fundamentally what the hell's going on here yeah i you know i've heard more than one person talk about how a carl i can't type could come in and uh buy up a bunch of shares and then force redemption to themselves of the underlying because uh, if you're running at negative 10 percent, all you have to do is be a billionaire and uh, buy up most of it get control and you'll get that other 10 cents for quote unquote free good work mm -hmm. so let's see outside of the world of financialization of bitcoin well that's debatable are do dlcs outside of that world Oh, wow. But um, That's a good point. So, um, a while back, uh, we covered on the show um, Shared Bits, um, and I believe they did actually collaborate with Crypto Garage on this as well. Um, new proposal for DLCs where instead of signing an entire price, you broke that down into individual digits in different decimal places and signed each individual digit so that you would use all of those signatures compressed together to create the valid settlement signature for that contract um, to allow for pretty much just needing less transactions because doing that kind of trick with the high um, decimal places it's just one signature one transaction on the outer bounds of a contract instead of having to make a single transaction for every single price that could be on the outside of both bounds um, which was a huge um, breakthrough but apparently um, that also led to a major slowdown in how fast the adapter signatures are made because the way dealing with individual signatures you have to combine works um, you're adding a bunch of new um, elliptic curve multiplication operations which are a lot more expensive computationally than addition so this optimization to have less transactions to handle actually made it take longer to generate the signatures for those transactions and so what crypto garage has done is play a couple neat little um, math and um, memory management games to try to bring that back down in line to what it used to be. And so essentially, um, the four things that they've done are, firstly, um, because all of these new multiplication operations you have to do revolve around the same public key, um, you can actually just simply factor that down and reduce that to a single uh, multiplication operation. So that's a huge gain brought back. Um, secondly, um, pre-computing the signature points used for producing the adapter signatures. And now with a very small amount of things, like let's say a contract that only has four potential outcomes, um, you're not seeing any gains that's still going to be for multiplication operations. But let's say you have 10 possible outcomes. Um, that would be over a thousand um, multiplication operations you have to do. But with pre-computation, that brings it down to 20, just a simple doubling. So that's another optimization gain. Um, the third one is actually memoizing the inputs because we're talking about numerical decomposition where they're just signing each individual digit instead of whole numbers. So pretty much um, decimal places that have the same repeating digits can be cached in the memory and just fed back into um, the algorithm again when it's time to input those again. Um, so that's a, a big um, computational improvement there. 
And then also, um, the last one, this is not always going to be generally applicable because um, using multiple cores is not something that's always possible or going to get done. But um, parallelizing the individual signature operations until you get to the point where you are finally combining everything into a single value. And so with all these neat four tricks, um, they've taken this massive increase in signature generation and brought it way back down closer to where it used to be. So rather than having to choose between a lot less transactions or quicker signature generation, those two things have been brought back a, a lot more in, in line with each other. I always love it when smart guys do the math so I don't have to. Mm -hmm. But you know, it just goes to show how flipping early everything is that we're still figuring out these new contract primitives and ways to optimize them just on the application layer. Like this is, this is winning, son. Keep her up. So let's see. Speaking of winning, uh, Bitcoin had a pretty big PR win this week out of Norway. Yeah. So um, it's actually two wins. I'm going to just kind of smush these together. But um, last week, Galaxy Digital, um, I think Michael Novogratz's um, investment company has partnered with Blockstream um, to start running mining operations. Um, and also... Um, the Acre Group, a uh, Norwegian holding company mostly involved in oil and gas and um, engineering and construction, um, has also partnered with Blockstream to initially set up mining operations, but also looking, um, based on the press release, to want to get involved in the space a lot more, um, such as actually holding liquid cash in Bitcoin for their company. Um, and kind kind of the way they were talking about Blockstream, especially mentioning things like their sidechain platform elements. Um, yeah, um, let's just say Galaxy Digital just seems like another crypto company kind of diving in um, to the mining space. Acre looks like a massive... <laughs> um, legacy holding company that wants to step a lot deeper in than just mining. <laughs> yeah, Galaxy Digital teaming up with Blockstream is interesting because they're very large and I suppose they're outsourcing what would be Blockstream's core competency uh, or to their core competency and hiring that on. That's usually how big companies do it. So it's interesting that they decided to see that. The uh, Acre announcement was to start a company called CT, which is an allusion to a book that I'm not going to be able to say anything about because I haven't read it. But it kind of sounds like they want to be a full Bitcoin VC over there, talking about investing in companies in the space, keeping their treasury in Bitcoin, uh, doing energy projects around Bitcoin, which is Acre's core competency, especially with stranded energy. Well, I mean, it's like I'm particularly interested in past the mining side because, you know, they, they've also mentioned they specifically want to use mining to um, help develop more renewable energy sources as well. Um, but I'm just thinking with the kind of just off the cuff mentioning of elements and side chains, um, where is their head at in terms of bitcoin based financial products around the energy market because you know you you mentioned something like elements my brain can't help but go there <laughs> yep and companies this big they're always wondering how are we going to get to market how are we going to get money in and out of this and uh, it seems like Blockstream is making a toolkit or stack of tools that a lot of people are taking note of this week. Mm -hmm. It's going to oh, be really man. weird watching this space just get eaten by legacy institutions, even though a lot of us have been screaming it's going to happen for years. Yeah, these legacy guys are going to show up and they're going to professionalize things. And just seeing Galaxy decide to go with Blockstream um 
you do the internal calculation as to do we have the core competency to build this or should we partner with somebody who does and i think you're going to see a lot of that going forward mm -hmm. well 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 so i think i think some pieces of shit did something stupid with something cool because they're stupid and i want to slap them oh man Yes, this is a very interesting story. The headline is $95,000 Banksy on camera to transform it into a maybe. Oops. Whoop. A group of financial traders torched a $95,000 Banksy on camera to transform it into a maybe more valuable NFT artwork. So this uh, group bought a Banksy. These guys are injective protocol a so-called DeFi platform that builds a Wall Street style derivative using blockchain based smart contracts. Uh, they bought Banksy's morons, uh, in parentheses, white from 2006, depicting a crowded auction room with an ornately framed piece beside the auctioneer inscribed with the words, I can't believe you morons actually buy this shit. And uh, what they do with their $95,000 painting well, they decided to burn it. So they uh, took a torch to it and then they put the video up on YouTube. And they've said, you know, NFTs, scarcity kind of a joke. But if we burn this painting, maybe we are putting more value into the NFT because you don't actually have the physical piece anymore. Personally, I couldn't be happier about this. I would say every single thing that's an NFT, you should definitely burn the original. If there is a physical one, please go do that. I think, you know, the museums could just clear out their warehouses, burn it all, and then put the JPEGs up somewhere. Um, it's fantastic. Of course, it doesn't do anything to guarantee the rarity of that JPEG or whatever file format you really care for. I mean, I would want a TIFF if I was buying a $95,000 NFT, but that's just me. So I applaud these guys for, you know, being original in this. My guess is Banksy loves this shit. Um, I just don't see it turning out well for them because now you just paid for a signature on a JPEG and there isn't even an original anybody can appreciate anymore. Yeah, Janine, I know you have to think this is as fucking stupid and idiotic as I do. Nah, Janine, it's genius. They ruined an actual piece of real physical art to make a stupid fucking they token. Could you could not have picked a better piece of art, though. It said, I can't believe you morons actually buy this shit. This is irony wrapped in irony on a blockchain. Yeah, but it ruined actual art to do it. Like, real, a real physical piece of art. Not a, not a stupid picture on a screen. Not a meme. Actual art. Like, I'm going to go full retard to the point... This is stupid. NFTs have gone so fucking stupid. They're not just being stupid off in their own little corner. They're actually convincing morons to destroy real art. Th this is cancer. This is cancer worse than anything the ICO stupidity was. See, some people think blockchains are relegated to the digital realm. This shows that the retardation in the digital realm can, in fact, leak into the physical realm. Burn it all. Burn it all, then? Not financial advice to all you expensive painting owners out there. It's just like, dude, I, it's, this is getting so stupid. Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to bring this up because this just shows that the deep end is deeper than you think in terms of blockchain stupid. I mean, it, 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 dude, like, sorry, if, if you're buying an NFT that is not a certificate of authenticity for real physical art, you're a fucking idiot. Like, you're an idiot. What are you doing? Go buy a fucking shit coin or something. At least that might be pumped by idiots and make you money. Like, what the fuck are you idiots doing? Yeah, I don't even think that people understand that 
the signature you get that is the NFT only allows you access through someone else's proprietary database to even view your art. It, it's not like you can just, you know, look at your little Pokeball of NFT and press the button and Pokemon comes out and like talks to you and whatnot. Nope, you're gonna go through somebody else's closed system to even view your Pokemon. It's like, this this money laundering. Like, okay, it's like plain and simple. I guarantee you half of the NFT shit in this space or more is just money laundering where some idiot did something illegal, didn't pay taxes, whatever, whatever the fuck it is. And I need to come up with an excuse why I have this fuck tons of money that I'm not supposed to. I'll just sell an NFT to myself. Sounds fantastic. It's technology in action. Truly regulatory arbitrage at its finest. Stupid. Speaking of organizations that are kind of looking to uh, do that arbitrage play or stim it, Looks like Visa's dropping news. Yeah, so this is really interesting. Um, a new startup called Moon um, that is plugged into the Visa network uh, is launching a um, browser plugin where you can effectively just go shop online anywhere that Visa is accepted. And when it comes time to check out um, with this plugin, um, be given a lightning invoice, pay that in lightning over Bitcoin, and then get access to a one use um, digital prepaid Visa card with no fees in the exact amount of that purchase to pay for that merchant order. And Currently, um, this is only in the U.S. Um, it's available, but um, other shitty side is um, they also have a Coinbase integration so that people can just pay directly out of Coinbase accounts on chain. Um, idiotic, but just just have general on chain support. Why why do you need an integration for that? But but anyway. Um, yeah, th this is a another interesting example of crypto stuff latching into legacy infrastructure like Visa and um, kind of bridging the gap between them. And the one thing I do kind of want to point out that I really like about this, um, kind of one of the huge benefits of something like Strike is you zap a lightning payment off to somebody. Um, that person isn't getting any information they can use to commit identity fraud, access your money through that information. Um, it kind of protects you from that identity theft risk. And Moon in a different way does the same thing. Um, these one-off cards of the exact amount, um, there's no more money after that's redeemed. Um, there is no way for any money to wind up on that in the structure of that after it's redeemed. And it can only be used once. So even though money is getting sent to somebody in terms of fiat instead of Bit or Bitcoin over Lightning, it's still providing that similar kind of like a merchant on the internet can't steal your identity and spend your money with this one-off virtual card. And it's another hook that's plugging into Visa. Right. These uh, one-off card numbers have been available from a number of companies for a while. So if you knew you wanted to make a purchase on some site that maybe you didn't inherently trust and uh, wanted a little insulation so they couldn't steal your card number, uh, a number of companies have allowed you to generate a one-time use card number uh, and then go plug that in, have it pay its thing and be done with it. This is really neat because Visa took the time to make the bridge so all you have to do is hit somebody with a lightning payment, it auto funds the one-time card and everything is great. So it, I think it's pretty cool to see them in this space developing this tech because it definitely shows that they are paying attention to future payment networks that may be considered their competitors. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like 
B- Bitcoin's not going anywhere until it sticks its tendrils into the existing system. And yeah, this is one of the ways it's happening. Loving it. Alrighty then. So the next thing, um, this is actually a really cool concept from John Carvalho, who's kind of just um, <clears throat> fell off the radar and is working on a company that still hasn't been publicly announced. Um, not really sure what kind of products or services they're trying to build, but um, he's dropped this new podcast or podcast the, called The Biz. Um, that's kind of an offshoot of this, not entirely related to play around with some of the ideas um, that the company's supposedly working on. And uh, TLDR, the podcast, is generally concentrating on the business side of this space, like actually getting a business up and running, operating it successfully. And um, the neat thing about this podcast is it's deploying a new model of monetizing things with micropayments. Um, everybody's obviously familiar with things like podcasting 2.0, um, micropayment paywalls. You want to look at something, zap over a payment, and it will unlock. But the kind of thing with that is how many people out there are actually willing to pay to view content versus expecting it for free because ads fund everything. And so what John's doing here to kind of twist things around is what he's calling a crowd wall. And so the idea here is instead of every individual person having to make a payment to consume the content, um, that piece of content has a target goal or price um, for whatever it's worth. And when anybody makes a a payment for that, um, it will unlock that proportion of the content for free for anybody to listen to. So effectively, that, that price goal for that piece of content can be crowdfunded from everybody. And for every second of content, paid for by anybody from the group, a second of content becomes available for everyone until when the goal is met, the content is just open and freely available for everybody. So like, I actually, I really like this idea because it's, it's kind of looking at this from both sides, the content creator and the content consumer. And looking at a way to kind of bridge the gap between, you know, people who won't pay for content like that regularly um, and those who will and, and kind of trying to smooth out all the wrinkles there so that the content creator is getting paid. Um, people who want to pay the content creator can, but people who either don't have the money or, or don't want to spend the money Um, on content creators will still eventually have free access to this content. And so, you know, I I don't want to reckon how successful this is going to be with this specific podcast, but just that model in general, I think is a a huge jump forward and a, and a, a good new approach to kind of thinking about monetizing content like that with micropayments. Yeah, I'm with you. I think this is fantastic. You know, podcasting 2.0, very neat. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, It's fun to see that getting legs under it uh, and people be having an easy way where they can pay for content that they value and be involved in the content that they value. Uh, This is uh, perhaps a different approach to that. And I think lightning is going to enable even more approaches than this. But uh, as somebody who's kind of a stingy fuck, uh, I really appreciate having access to content that people work really hard to produce that I am not paying for. So the, the fact that the crowd can unlock it for everybody and potentially reward the creator to the degree that they want, but still benefit the community with the thoughts that are encapsulated therein. That's fantastic. Um, 
I, I hope he does well with this. Uh, I agree with you. If, if not in this, then others will use this and do well with it, I assume. Uh, also, in that write-up, it said 50% of all proceeds for the first season will be donated to a cause chosen by each guest. Uh, this is kind of one of those podcasting 2.0 type systems uh, where you can sub-delegate payments ahead of time to the creators, or in this case, uh, your guest can decide who they would like to benefit from their time spent with you, which is just great. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's just, there's so much you can play with this that just doesn't lock everything up for the few people willing to toss money every week. I mean, it's like, you know, like you said, I I'm of the same mindset. Like I will pay for content sometimes, but I'm not just going to throw money around everywhere. Every time I want to consume content, like money adds up and like, that's just awesome. Like I, I can't do that this month. Okay. Whatever. I'm going to wait till the, the crowd wall, gets smashed down and, and I can just listen to it. But like, Hey, that one day that guest is there. I just want to hear this now. I'm super fucking interested. Just click. I can just fucking pop in and do that. And it, like, you know what I mean? It's that ebb and flow where as a group, like everybody's like, you know what I mean? Like you're really interested in something one week. You're the guy who paid and gets that available for everyone. I'm really interested in something the next week. I'm the guy who does that. But it's just such a perfect like balance of things. Yep. And hopefully it means the creators are going to be properly incentivized to keep making content that we all like. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you, you can really play with that too. I mean, like imagine like you, you don't even have to do this in the sense of like, this is unlocked forever um once the crowd goal is hit like maybe that unlocks it for six months and then anything's more than six months back like that's an archive that resets and isn't like you, you know what i mean like you if, if you really sit down and think about this like you can play with how you want to coordinate this every way from sunday but still ultimately have that dynamic of like everybody's pitching in and then click anyone can look at it yep i assume people can still donate once it's unlocked and i assume people will but you're right there's a lot of models that we're gonna have to think about pretty soon around content fun times ahead but yeah that john um really knocked it out of the park with this idea because it's just like this i would love to see and internet run on micro payments instead of advertising but the idea that everything would just run on one person paying for everything that one person consumes like i wouldn't even do that <laughs> so it's like in what world could that actually work at a massive of enough scale to actually start crippling advertising with everyone <laughs> yep i i certainly know that I would feel more like doing my part if I didn't have to sit through four minutes of ads. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see. Next on the docket, looks like there's more news around Russia's central bank planning on showcasing a ruble-backed digital currency later this year, also known as a CBDC. This is according to its deputy chairman, Alexei Zabatkin. So evidently, uh, Navalina, I'm going to forget her first name, announced last year that they were looking into CBDCs over there in Russia. And in this case, it sounds like they'll actually issue a prototype after getting positive feedback from their market, uh, which I suppose is Russian banks, uh, around such project. And uh, I kind of liked it. Uh, Zabakin said, the prototype would be available for people to, quote, kick its tires, unquote. Uh, absolutely love it. So evidently, they're going to put this out first as a prototype. No real money transactions, but it's pr probably kind of a, a test bed to let these banks in to play with it and give them feedback and refine it. And then they claim that will impact the next development steps of it. 
Uh, so just one more little piece of info um, that some central banks out there are working on CBDCs a little faster than in the West. But are they really CBDCs or are they just new replacements for their equivalent of Fedwire or just new giant PayPal databases? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the details are thin. And you know what? I want details around these things. So I guess we'll find out soon. I just don't see Russia um, doing anything but making a new PayPal database. Like it's the same kind of shit as in China for the most part from like everything they've done legislatively, regulatorily. Like you can buy it. You can own it. You can sell it. Uh-uh. You can't use this as money. That's not money. We make the money. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I assume these are all PayPal database style currencies until they show otherwise. Uh, not a lot of central bankers have come out to talk about how their CBDCs will not be full of surveillance tools and completely transparent uh, to the banking side. Uh, I believe Chom's recent paper uh, is more blinded on that. We haven't covered it yet because I haven't gotten to reading it. Uh, but I have heard Jerome Powell comment that he thinks CBDCs should be more cash-like. So I think it's still open to what a CBDC actually means. And uh, we'll just have to wait for somebody to ship one so we can actually critique what it is as opposed to the idea of what it is. Yep. I think everybody in this space has completely different ideas on what they are. Yeah. Alrighty. Let's see more, more exciting innovations. So, um, before I go any further, um, this is a beta release. It is not final production. So under no circumstances, take this and upload a device with things like all your cold storage and savings on it yet. That means but, you're punks. <laughs> But um, there is a beta release for the 4.0.0 cold card um, firmware, which um, the biggest change so far is goodbye all of the Trezor library code um, for key management, signing, etc. Um, it has been replaced with libsec P256K1 out of core, so all bare metal, super efficient um, shit. Um, as well, um, they have a new pure assembly implementation of the AS or AES, uh, 256 CTR, um, to speed up USB communications. Um, they've optimized the, uh, double hashing code for SHA-256, pretty much all of the prior cryptographic code that came from Trezor libraries is gone. Um, new feature, they have the ability to import um, a seed phrase and then calculate the last word, the checksum, um, to, to allow you to put your own self-generated seed in. Now, if you are doing anything but rolling secure dice or flipping a coin, and manually verifying the words that those map to before you put them in, stop, do not use this, you're going to fuck something up. Flip a coin, roll dice, get a long binary number, and then break that up into 11 digit chunks and go look at the word on the word seed list. If you are doing anything but that, you are doing it wrong, do not use this feature. But if you do it right, this does allow you to completely verify the entire seed that you generated from random entropy is the correct seed it should be. Just do it right. Another new feature, um, the ability to quickly clone an existing cold card over micro SD and import that to a uh, non-initialized cold card. Um, a bug fix um, where the address explorer was not showing the correct addresses when using um, 
non-zero account numbers. Um, they now have reproducible builds for the firmware. Um, they have the paper wallet feature um, brought back, which was temporarily removed, I believe, when the CK Bunker stuff was introduced um, just for space optimization temporarily. Um, and as well, um, they've started setting up the um, encrypted backup files on SD cards with random words and numbers instead of something specifically kind of giving away it's a cold card backup file. And one important thing to um, point out here is the Mark IIs um, are going to struggle a little bit to run all of these features because they have less memory than the Mark III. And lastly, anybody using um, a cold card with uh, the CK bunker in HSM mode, any user registered with a password um, is going to have to re-register because the hash algorithms have changed um, for the password verification. But um, yeah, like I said, beta release, do not put on your cold storage device, but oh boy, is this going to be fun to play with when the, the final release drops. Oh yeah, there were a number of features in there that sound super interesting. Being able to clone a cold card easily, uh, I think is fantastic. Uh, but remember kids, beta, 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 beta. That means it's not for you, probably. So use, use your discretion here. And um, yeah. This release has effectively brought um, all of the GPL code from Trezor and their libraries totally out of the code base. So the entire firmware code base is now under the MIT CC license. So whiny butthurt people who like to scream that it's not open source, even though I can look at all the code and make sure it does what it's supposed to and it's secure. Cry about it. Cry harder. Okay. All right. Prepare for me to fail. All right. So this week, a group called Orin Labs released a little paper called Prime Plus Probe 1, JavaScript 0, Overcoming Browser-Based Side Channel Defenses. What is a side channel attack, you might ask? In computer security, a side channel attack is any attack based on information gained from the implementation of a computer system rather than weaknesses in the implemented algorithm itself. Timing information, power consumption, electromagnetic leaks, or even sound can provide an extra source of information, which can be exploited, according to Wikipedia. So. These guys decided, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we could figure out some things about your web browser and have invented novel ways to implement some of these so-called side channel attacks. So the paper details several ways which they attack the browser and eventually builds up to an attack method called CSS Prime Plus Probe. This is pretty interesting stuff. And it has to do with loading a kind of a nonsense web page that has really, really long classes or ID tags on divs on a very simple page. Enough so that those strings, approximately 2 million characters, are long enough to fill up the cache on your given computer system. And then based on that cache filling up, they can implement some of these timing attacks and searching for things in that very, very long string that they already know aren't there. And then they can profile your system based on that. And then they go into more details about how based on that profile, they can do things like tell whether you've been to one of the Alexa top 100 websites or not. I think that last part is just to prove that this has some use. I'm, I'm quite sure somebody who knows what they're doing could do something more interesting than that. But they preview how this works across all kinds of architectures from Intel to AMD to Apple's M1 uh, to a number of others. Uh, it has varying degrees of effectiveness across architectures, but essentially 
this is a way to fingerprint your architecture without having telltale cookies, etc., involved, and then attack it to learn other things about you just based on what's sitting in your cache. So effectively, uh, it's, it's, sorry, go ahead. I, I wasn't going to have much more to say other than I'm not a security researcher and I'm not doing this justice. Uh, but it's fascinating. They got a dismissive reply from Apple uh, on this, and they essentially said to get around this form of attack, you would need to significantly slow down web browsers and divorce them much more from the underlying operating systems, which would make them much less performant. So pretty much the long and short I take away from this is that even with all JavaScript blocked, um, just using CSS, you can actually attack somebody's browser and learn the system architecture thereon, which is needed information to start thinking of more tailored or damaging attacks that you could pull on somebody by just knowing more about the specific system they're running on. Yep, you got it. And I didn't do a very good job of summarizing that part. But what's especially novel about this is a lot of times this is why Tor uh, would say default to turning off JavaScript execution. Or you might want to do that just to give attackers one less way that they can attack your system by checking performance on various underlying JavaScript processes uh, that they might be able to fingerprint back to a system. These guys refined it to the point of a plain Jane HTML page just with CSS on it, and then doing queries for items on the page using the HTML DOM that says, hey, uh, give me the element on the page with ID X, or search for something with CSS class Y. And just with that, which you pretty much have to have to render a web page these days, uh, you can do these types of attacks. Scary stuff. Yeah. Slightly less scary thing. I will probably not do justice myself either. Um, but yeah. Um, so there is a vulnerability in Git where if a, uh, a specifically crafted repository using symbolic links between files and potentially things like um, git lfs which if i remember right is pretty much just a filter to download very large files in a repo lazily instead of all at once but um when you clone such a repo on a file system that is case insensitive so it doesn't matter whether you're doing uppercase or lowercase in the file system um, could actually trigger scripts in that repo to execute so pretty much you're you're a programmer or a software engineer and you're farting around and oh here's a random repo that does exactly what I need clone and you happen to be running on um, Windows or Mac with, say, NTFS, um, if that random repo that does what you want is set up by some malicious jackass, um, you just got tricked into downloading something and running a script on your computer. Yay. Yeah. So this is only for case insensitive file systems. I think most modern Mac OS systems are not that. But of note, Windows, by default, runs on case insensitive file systems, I believe. Uh -huh. Not good. So the moral of the story is everything can always have bugs in it. And don't just download random code from strange GitHub repos. True that. Stay safe, people. Alrighty. There they do note some mitigations. If you're worried about this, uh, you can turn off some features in Git. Oh, yeah. What were those? Um, yeah, disable symbolic links and disable process filters support. And avoid cloning unt untrusted repositories. Yep. So, guess that rounds off the news desk for the day. Well... This is the part I've been looking forward to. Janine's final thought. I knew we should have put her in the Pokeball. Tell me your dreams. Well, Man, I'm betting. I think that's...
I'm betting she went Absolutely. AFK. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe she converted herself into an NFT, and now she's just not here anymore. <laughs> That'd be no good. Yeah. All righty, though. What, 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 what thoughts you got to cough up, Fud? Man, I was working on it. I guess we kind of covered some NFT thoughts earlier. We, uh, we talked about GBDC a little bit. I, I think there's, there's some interesting stuff around scarcity and just how this space is structured. And I, I don't know how to speak to it. But uh, you guys got to remember that the real thing is different than a proxy for the real thing. Whether it's physical Bitcoin versus Bitcoin sitting at BlockFi, or it's a real Banksy versus a charred pile of ash represented by a, a token on a blockchain somewhere, just be really careful what you get. When you ask for the real thing, make sure you get the real thing if that's what you're after. If you just want a proxy of it, that's great. But try to know what you're getting into here. Yep. In what the real world, there? money laundering. That's what they're getting into. Ooh. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just thinking about what kind of beer I want to buy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One other thing I, I noted this week is, you know, the world took note of us uh, hitting 60K on the Bitcoin price, of course, in US dollars in this case. And uh, there were some serious uh, gold fudders out on Twitter yesterday, and I thought that was kind of fun. Um, a lot of gold holders kind of treat their gold like NFTs, uh, in that their gold lives in a vault somewhere, and they've got some way to supposedly get it out of the vault. Yet, they treat it as if it's their gold. So. Same advice to you gold guys. If you want the real thing, make sure you get the real thing before you really want the real thing. All right. I guess my last final thought is, um, so I just found out something amazing this week. If you like weird, crazy people's YouTube channels, old Rusty Shackleford, the voice actor from King of the Hill, has his own YouTube channel. And woo is it crazy silly shit so yeah <laughs> that's a thing <laughs> all right i think we could all use the entertainment yeah but i guess on that note we will call it a wraps for the day adios punks peace out boys and girls <laughs> Was there, was there, that's a good